as the Dominion of Canada mourned. In Europe, an important meeting among state leaders occurred. Mussolini, Valois, Beria, and other interested parties arrived in Birmingham to discuss their common ground. It had been agreed that Maximism, Sorelianism, and National Syndicalism all shared basic principles of the state's primary in the socialist struggles. The role of national identity within the state and importance of a strong central authority to preserve and build socialism. The Charter also claimed the socialist state was the final stage of human development and that democracy was not necessary to achieve socialism. These statements had drawn great criticism from other socialist factions who gave it the name Totalism as a play on totalitarian socialism which had been eagerly accepted by Mosley who added it to the manifesto's name attributing it to their total commitment to socialism. But the tales of totalism fell on deaf ears as in Canada the new King Edward barely got over the grief of losing his father when he had to write a speech for his coronation. For now the people mourned as well and in 28 days Edward would address the people via radio to encourage them and convince them of a hopeful path that awaited Canada and British citizens that had fled the country. The conservative R.B. Bennett saw an opportunity to strengthen his position in Parliament with the help of the new king as his current state was weak. But that would all come in due time as he did not want to press the matter on a grieving son. But even before the coronation, Edward's ruling capability and decision making were already put to the test as an unexpected visitor associated with Alexander Kolchak arrived. The envoy informed Edward about King George's previous support of Kolchak's 1925 unsuccessful coup in Petrograd. Another humiliation by the infamous year of 25. Still fueled by determination, he assured the king that this time the rogue admiral would triumph. However, he once again requested support from the Entente. None of Edward's advisors opted for a full cooperation, but there were some who could see a potential benefit. Edward was insulted that they came pleading for the support of a coup even before the official coronation had started. It was almost as if he waited for Edward's father to die to seize his opportunity. Edward decided to offer Kolchak only limited support in the form of equipment. No British or Canadian blood would be spilt over this matter. With the coronation of Edward VIII, the government was now prepared to convene the Eighth Imperial Conference which would gather the heads of the governments of Australasia, Delhi, the West Indies Federation and Canada in Ottawa to discuss the goals and future of the scattered dominions of the British Empire. The invitations were sent out on January the 23rd of 1936. A week later, the government leaders had arrived and the conference was officially underway. It would last for several days. The first day of the conference was meant to portray the layout and the goal of the empire. The Prime Minister of Canada gave a rousing speech claiming that everyone needed to work to improve and better the dominions of the empire. Edward wisely advised the Prime Minister to keep syndicalism out of the speech as it was still too early to showcase Canada's fists to Europe. Following the 1926 German intervention in China and the Treaty of Nanjing signed in November of that year, foreign trade was left to the richest city of the coast under the joint control of world powers owning interests in China. The independence of these consortium of cities was guaranteed by eight powers. Australasia, Austria, Canada, Germany, Japan, the French Republic, Russia and the USA. Foreign investments and the legation cities themselves flourished not only through foreign trade but also thanks to smuggling into alg ost asian and King Imperial territories. Though the global economy seemed to fail, at least Canada still had this at their backs. A few days later, the Indian Empire stood central in the Imperial Conference. 
The delegate from Delhi delivered a stirring speech about how Canada must aid them in liberating the rest of India from the chains of anarchists and traitorous princes that broke up the crown jewel of the empire. The delegate also spoke for some time on the trade benefits for the Entente if India was united and how it would play a key role in retaking Great Britain from the traitors. Edward agreed. He came to understand that the first target in this future war would not be Britain itself, but crippled countries from the land grab that were the result of the 1925 revolution. Declaring war on the Union of Britain meant declaring war on the syndicalists, and Edward agreed that he would stand beside India. Two days later, the delegate of the West Indies Federation spoke about the needs for investing in the various dominions stressing that the British Dominions needed a strong economy in order to take back Great Britain from the anarchist traders that took control over the country. The earlier mentioned element of a united India would play a crucial role into achieving this. Edward once again assured that he would make this happen. All the while this occurred, the United States of America tumbled into turmoil as different ideologies clashed among its common people, some hinting towards violence. Then on the 1st February Monday of 1936, the Berlin Stock Exchange that had been constantly sinking plunged. Fueled by the instability of the market panic, selling erupted as soon as the stock market opened on that Monday morning. It took well into the night for the teleprinters to stop spurting out the results of what became known as Black Monday. When the results had been analyzed, it was clear that the situation had only gotten worse. The shock of this unprecedented economic catastrophe would be felt over the entire world. The German Golden Age had ended for now. Now that several weeks had surpassed, the issue of the two large factions within the Canadian political system came to light. One of these factions was led by the Prime Minister, who sought to develop and refine Canada's industrial strength and harvest its resources over foreign policy and the others, led by R.B. Bennett and his supporters in the British diaspora, who wished to mobilize the Canadian economy to launch an invasion of the Union of Britain in the near future, even if that meant accelerating arms production at the expense of civil liberties. Edward could decide not to mingle with any of them, but he assured Bennett that he would get his wish of an invasion, but not at the quick pace as he wanted it. Edward reminded him of the delegate from Delhi and that Canada's eyes needed to be fixed on India for now. As Edward had sided with the Conservatives, words against the Union of Britain would be mentioned in his speech during the coronation. It was time for the King's first radio address since his father's passing. The King had spoken to the nation and had electrified it. From Vancouver to St. John, from Toronto to the Arctic, Canadians everywhere buzzed with excitement after hearing the charismatic and forceful speech denouncing cynicalism and the king's pledge to one day finish the war that his father began and reclaim Britain. He finished the speech with a sneer towards the Union as he mentioned that Canadians were to never trust the Union of Britain or its insidious cynicalist allies. Weapon and equipment production was slowly increased despite the lack of certain resources. Possibilities for an invasion of the home islands, dubbed homecoming planning, were created in secret. But Edward mentioned he would not touch those documents until Canada itself and its dominions were more stable. Nevertheless, a watchful eye needed to be kept on the syndicalists in Europe, and so a new head of military intelligence, Henri Carrard, was put in position. With turmoil brewing in the US to the south, Edward first wanted to make the citizens feel secure by starting a path towards the defense of his own realm. This would bring a greater strength to the Canadian Army, Navy and Air Force. The increasing syndicalist threat in the US was used as the grand motivative factor. In Russia, plans were set in motion to reintroduce Okanka, the Russian secret police organization. The assassination of Kerensky was used as the means to approve this. Some conspiracy theorists believed it were they who organized the assassination on their own president behind the curtains. Besides the Union of Britain, the Commune of France had an important event as well that year. 
The Commune of France was the world's leading syndicalist nation, united as Federation of City Communes and erected by the Comité de Salut Public, the chief executive. Ever since its inception, however, the Second Commune was not uniform in its policy. Numerous factions arose, each one with their own idea of which France should take. As the time for revenge against Germany and the World Revolution closed in, the CGT election of 1936 was very important. So important, in fact, that none of the four factions could acquire a majority. Much like before the election, a coalition once again must be found. On the final day of the Imperial Conference, the 6th of February, the delegate from Australasia spoke of the need for scientific investment. The economy needed modern science in order to keep up the pace and not stagnate, while the military needed the most modern weapons to take back India and Great Britain. Edward remembered that his father was fond of science and so agreed to delve deeper into Canada's research and development. And then the conference of 1936 was over. The delegates were pleased with how Edward performed. There was hope that perhaps the conference marked the dawn of a new era for the dominions and a strengthening of bonds. But then, on that same day, before the delegates had even returned to their own country, word came out that the Emirate of Afghanistan had declared war on the Dominion of India.